All right, so thank you to the organizers for the invitation. Of course, I would very much like to be in Poland and sadly cannot be talking with you all at the conference, but we'll do this instead and hope for better times. Um, so I'm going to talk um, today about uh, triple natural orbital theory for three body electron correlation. So the, oh dear, okay. The context uh, for this is uh, we have a, a very good method, which is the couple cluster method that converges more or less exponentially towards the exact answer as you include a higher body correlation, two body, three body, and so on. And for a, a wide variety of chemical systems that are more or less single reference, we can approximate three body correlation with uh, the parentheses T method. So that's a very useful tool, but it has very poor scaling. So this is the context of, of my method to try and improve this very bad situation that if you can do a calculation on a small fragment of zeolite, maybe it takes two hours on, on a node. If you then want to do a more realistic uh, fragment of zeolite and the interaction of this methane with it, it will take you two years because of the very poor scaling with system size. So that's the context. And the framework um, within which we address that problem. Um, a number of people are doing this. We've seen talks, very nice talks, uh, in this sort of direction, is to make a low rank approximation of the double. So in pair natural orbital theory, this is the essence of it, is that you make a, a low rank approximation of the doubles amplitudes. So for every pair of orbitals ij, you approximate the matrix of coefficients ab in this, um, in this way. So you have a very small set of active orbitals, A tilde, B tilde, um, that you're going to use for your calculation. And you have the orbital rotation coefficients that take you from the full set down to this subset. And the particular thing about pair natural orbital theory is that every orbital pair has its own set of virtual orbitals that are adapted to the characteristics of the correlation for that pair. And indeed the number of orbitals that you have for each pair of electrons it is, is different. So for the more significant pairs, you have more orbitals than for the less significant pairs. So how do you um, go about choosing what those orbitals are? So that in pair natural orbital theory, this comes from this observation that goes back to Lovdin, Lovdin um, who said that for a two electron wave function um, in a basis of M orbitals, you can find a subspace of uh, um, small m functions that is optimal by selecting the natural orbitals with largest occupation numbers. So I'm going to talk you through a little bit about where that comes from, what, what he did. So it's basically the best overlap. So if you imagine you have a set of functions, your set of orbitals that you're going to choose from, and you're going to select p prime of them, and you're going to discard the p double prime ones, and you want to rotate the orbitals to give you that maximum separation to give to, to such that the overlap between your original wave function and the one projected onto the selected orbitals is maximal. So it's a maximal overlap criteria. So the projection operator um, that projects directly onto for, for an n electron wave function that projects directly onto the, um, the subspace. Can you see my mouse? I can't see my mouse, you probably can't see my mouse. Okay, I'll just talk you through it. Is the second no, line to... What's that? We cannot see it, at least not that. No. Yeah, I can't see my mouse, so I imagine that you can't. Thank you. Um, the, so you can either frame that in terms of the orbitals you're projecting onto, or in terms of the project orbitals that you're projecting out. So this is the one minus um, terms. Um, and for two electron systems, only the first two of those out projected terms survive. And the natural orbitals, so that the first term is, is one, then the next term is the one particle RDM, the next term is the two particle RDM and so on. For two electron systems, the natural orbitals that diagonalize the one particle RDM also diagonalize the two particle RDM, they diagonalize the coefficients. And so it reduces just so the overlap between the wave function and its projected approximant reduces to one minus half times the sum of the natural orbital values. And so this 
um, is Termwise um, allows you to remove orbitals to, um, so you remove the orbitals with the smallest coefficients, smallest occupation numbers, and you systematically termwise converge to the right answer. So you, you always remove the smallest amount. So for pair natural orbital theory, the way it works is, of course, you don't have the wave function to perform that density to find the subspace. So you make a model, and that model is typically done from um, a low cost uh, doubles. Uh, amplitude, which is the semi-canonical MP2, because I'm going to localize in a minute. Um, the, we are selecting virtual orbitals, we're not selecting occupied, so the relevant density is the one that you make from the first order operator, so you, it's a contraction of the doubles amplitude to make the external density, and you select the virtual orbital, you rotate from the canonical orbitals to the um, pair natural orbitals for each pair, and you select um, you select the orbitals that have occupation numbers um, above a particular threshold. So there's one dial, and that automatically has a bigger um, subspace for significant pairs because the density is bigger and a smaller um, set of orbitals for um, insignificant pairs because the density is smaller from that pair. Um, if you localize your occupied orbitals, this automatically leads to a linear scaling um, increase of, of your doubles amplitude space. And the reason for that is that um, when you are describing the correlation of two electrons that are in one region of space, you don't need virtual orbitals that are far away. And so they automatically have small occupation number vectors and are discarded. And the, the number of orbitals that you need per electron pair goes to a constant. Uh, not, it's not a constant, but it's of order one. It doesn't grow with system size. In addition, in local approximation uh, methods, um, because in insulators, electron correlation is short range, the longest length scale of electron correlation is the van der Waals um, through space interaction, which decays is one over r to the six. At some point, you can say that the correlation is insignificant and you can discard it, so the number of pairs also grows, then grows linearly with system size. So the information content goes from n to the four down to order n, just automatically, just just using this pair natural orbital transformation and local orbitals. That, that's the essence of pair natural orbital theory. So the scheme for a higher level calculation is the following. You localize your occupied orbitals, you build a low cost approximation for your doubles amplitudes, you use that to select the natural orbitals, pair natural orbitals, and then you solve your higher level equations in that subspace. What you have to do then is to transform all of your integrals to that subspace. So there's a lot of integral transformations and so on, which introduces expense. But this, the saving that you make by having a very small set of orbitals per electron pair is enormous. And it takes you, um, you can build a linear, almost linear scaling theory based on that. And you have this one dial, which is this pair natural orbital occupation number threshold. Um, which goes from 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 9 in this um, error plot. This is for the test set of isomerization energies, um, the ISO L24 set, and it converges smoothly to the canonical result. So it's a really controllable error. Um, and the timings here are for the um, alkane chains, and you can do C60, um, so C64H126 in a triple zeta basis in a couple of hours, less than a couple of hours in a triple zeta basis set. There are some extra, extra steps that you need to put in to really make a linear scaling theory, and they're to do with the other parts of the calculation. So you need local density fitting, and um, we use projected atomic orbitals in addition. Um, but I'm not going to talk about much of those steps. What I want to talk about today is um, the extension of that idea to three body correlation. So in general, when you're building this overlap of your um, wave function and it's approximate by projecting it onto an orbital subspace, um, you, you have these extra terms. You have the density, the one particle RDM, the two particle RDM, three particle RDM, and so on, and they all have contributions. And for anything that's not a two electron system, diagonalizing the, natural, the, the one particle RDM doesn't diagonalize all of the other terms. It doesn't diagonalize the two RDM and so on. So 
using natural orbitals doesn't guarantee a maximum overlap. So although they do provide a compression, it's not optimal. So what, what can you do that's a bit more optimal? Well, if you remove one orbital at a time, then only the one RDM term contributes because everything else of the bits that you've removed don't contribute. You only have one orbital that you've removed. So each, so that linearizes the problem. So what you can do is you can build uh, the one particle RDM using a model set of amplitudes, three body amplitudes, um, remove one orbital, which projects onto a subspace, build the density again, remove another orbital, build density again, and so on and so on and so on. So each step then is optimal. It's not clear that the whole path would be optimal, but at least each step is optimal. The other thing that you can do is just pretend that the other higher order terms are small, or assume that they're small, and just linearize, and that's equivalent then to just using natural orbitals for the three body density. So I did some calculations on a test set to uh, probe the accuracy of those two methods. But first, I need to tell you about. Um, where we get so you know for, for a three body wave function we don't have it at the beginning we need to build a model for it in order to find the subspace so in pair natural orbital theory the model amplitudes are mp2 like some economical mp2 like the very low cost for three body correlation the low cost approximation is the parentheses t so that would make sense if you were doing a full t ccsd full t or higher but in the context of a, um, just if you want the parentheses T um, energy, then it, it's, it's an issue. So the, um, okay, so what have I got here? So just to remind you what the three body amplitudes are. So the, the amplitudes are um, essentially you have a, a probability amplitude for a doubles, and then it scatters again through another body correlation. So it's two coupled double, um, correlation processes essentially is what it looks like. So because it costs and um, it can be very expensive to get the model amplitudes, there are, um, the original uh, proposal by that came from the NISA group wasn't to do that using the triples density, but to do something else. What they did is they built a three body space from um, by averaging the two body spaces. And that sort of makes sense that you have two coupled um, double excitation processes. So let's just average over all the double process, double electron process, and, and see what we get. It's not really the right thing because they should. It should have one happening and then another one extending from there, rather than just averaging them. But it, it doesn't. It's not awful. And um, the right thing to do would just be to build the um, the semi-canonical triples, which is the T zero, and find the density based on that. There's something in between that you can do, which is to build the correct um, T3 or semi-canonical T3 amplitudes um, just for the di kind of diagonal pairs, IIJ, um, IIK, etc., and average over those. So I did some tests to um, examine the, um, the errors that you make by uh, selecting linearly optimally or just linearly and through these different uh, ways of building the three electron density. So this plot is a summary of the results which has got a lot of information on. So the test set that I used was the S66 set. So these are weak interactions which traditionally would be hard for a local correlation theory method to do. Um, the errors I'm plotting are errors in the binding energies, um, mean absolute errors over the test set. And it was a subset of the S66 because I was computing three body correlation very inefficiently in order to do these tests. So I couldn't do them all. Um, the, for context, so you, I've also got on this plot the error that you make at the, in the CCSD level. And I'm plotting against the mean number of orbitals in the domain. So the mean number of uh, PNOs for the CCSD um, curve and the mean number of TNOs for the uh, triples curves. So these, the thin red lines I'll talk about first, this is the error that you make at the CCSD level with the vertical crosses. The um, diagonal crosses are the error that you make in the parentheses T energy 
due to having truncated the T2 amplitudes. So those are similar in magnitude um, and fairly small as a function of the number of uh, PNOs. The error that you make by truncating the TNO space is larger um, per PNO, uh, per TNO, sorry, um, in general. So let's first, let's next talk about the, the, the red line and the blue line. So this is the difference between doing the optimal uh, linearization. So this is doing um, full triples, forming the density and removing one orbital at a time in an optimal way versus just you doing building the density once and uh, removing orbitals just based on that one density. And they're basically the same. So that does imply that these higher order terms in this overlap metric are not that important in, in actuality. So the natural orbital compression works very well. The blue, greeny blue line is what you would get by doing this averaging over the pair domains versus doing a proper treatment of the triples. And you can see that you it, it really wastes a lot of effort. You've got orbitals in there that are not important. And conversely, you're, you're not targeting the orbitals that are really important that you would get by building a model, a correct model, uh, triples density. And the slightly better approximation by um, averaging the pairs of triples is the purple line. And that's a little bit better, but not a lot. Okay. That's everything I wanted to say about that. So the conclusions are that the proposal from NISA um, definitely has room for improvement, but practically um, is it makes sense. But once you have already built a triples, so once you've done a T0, you should use that to compress further to, to do the, the step from um, the semi-canonical triples to full triples, or if you're going to go higher in to uh, so I mean full parentheses T, or if you're doing full triples, then you should you should use this compression then. Okay, so the scheme then for the parentheses T energy is the following. Um, so you do as you did for the CCSD, you merge the doubles spaces to form a triple space um, using a, a looser threshold. You build T, the semi-canonical T2, you get a density from that, and you do a further compression to do the step from the semi-canonical triples to the full triples. Um, and we don't do that by solving iterative equations. Instead, we, we do Laplace transform. Um, okay. So there's one extra step that's really important in making the method efficient. And that's not only um, selecting orbitals, but selecting, but you need to be able to introduce a compact functional support. And, and that's done by first forming projected atomic orbitals and select making a domain of those from which you then build um, natural orbitals or pair natural orbitals or triple natural orbitals. But the same idea for that compression can be used in both cases. So the natural orbital domain, you're selecting a set of P primes out of the full set by allowing orbital rotations, but you can do, that would maximize the overlap of your um, approximate with the, the, the full thing. You can do the same um, thing. You can select orbitals that maximize that overlap, but not allowing rotation this time, but just selecting. So projected atomic orbitals are non-orthogonal and redundant. Um, this, this, uh, in terms of spanning the virtual space. So it, in the maximal, it, when, when you work out the overlap metric, you, uh, the, you, you get a, when you, when you work out this Q, this overlap, you get the inverse overlap metric appearing. So that becomes a bit more complicated. And this is really important for, as I said, for, for reducing the cost of these integral transformations, because you end up with a, a, a small compact set of projected atomic orbital domains, and then the transformation from that to TNOs uh, then becomes linear scaling rather than um, high scaling. So in this um, selection step rather than a rotation step, because they're um, non-orthogonal and redundant, the full optimization is probably NP-hard. 
that means that um, yeah, you really need to do a full search over all possible sets, subsets, in order to find the maximum. That's impractical, but you can make a good approximation using a greedy algorithm. So you can initialize with the projected atomic orbital that has the maximal contribution to this um, to the overlap, um, this Q metric. Then you can compute the weight for all of the PAOs that you're currently considering if you included them. Select the one with the largest weight and repeat. And you can form this weight metric, but you have this inverse, um, the inverse overlap metric forms complication, but you can do that efficiently by using um, this block diagonal form for the, uh, for the overlap. So you can end up building the weight for if you included the next orbital just through a, an inversion of a number because it's one at a time, um, and a set of matrix vector operations. So th this then becomes very efficient. So the scheme then overall is that for you have, you've localized your occupied orbitals, this is then a cartoon, right? So you have a set of localized occupied orbitals, and the next, the blue, the yellow line is the set of um, projected atomic orbitals that could go to describe the correlation of that pair. You maximize this um, trace, to select a subset of PAOs that maximize that trace. And again, that has a, a threshold which determines how big that domain is, which is big for important pairs, small for, um, so the threshold is the same, but you end up with a bigger domain for important pairs and a smaller domain for, in, for less important pairs, and similarly for triples. Then from that subset, you do a compression down to, to either the pair natural orbitals or the triple natural orbitals. So at every point where you're doing this, um, compression of the orbital space, you're also selecting a subspace of, of PAOs for that domain. And that introduces and uh, it greatly reduces the prefactor of many steps and it reduces the scaling of other steps. So how big are these domains and how much is the error that you introduce? So this again is for the S66 set. Um, so the typical domain sizes for the PAOs are only of a few hundred per pair, that's kind of averaged. And that, that's more or less at where it saturates. And that's compared to kind of a thousand or, or more if you're just using projected atomic orbitals in, in the normal way that the MOLPRO and Chris Core and other codes do based on uh, nearest neighbors and so on, where you, you include all uh, PAOs from an atom or bonding pairs and so on. Here you really get a very big compression of the projected atomic orbital space. And the pair natural orbital space it really is tiny. Um, and of course it increases as you decrease the threshold and the errors that you're making in this S66 set in k cals per mole with the default tolerance of 10 to the minus seven of 0.2 k cals per mole. And you have a, a, something that's almost linear scaling. It's kind of sub quadratic. So this is really a very useful theory. It's a very useful approach. It's hard to parallelize, so it yeah, it you can't really scale it up to massive things, but certainly for something well yet to we'll work on that when that's work in progress. But the what you can do is for for example, for this example uh, for the methane H chabobite um interaction uh, that would have taken two years using the canonical theory using this. Um, compressed theory with all the bells and whistles. So I've got about 80 atoms, about 200 uh, basis functions, uh, sorry, 2000 basis functions. It CCSD parentheses T in a triple zeta basis with the default threshold is, is done in two and a half hours. And you get a number that you trust. So in comparison, well, it's only a, kind of an order of magnitude slower than doing a B3 lip calculation. So it's really useful in, in comparable you would think about doing that and because it's a dispersion bound system using dft you can get anything you like depending on what dispersion interaction parameter you have whereas you would trust the couple cluster number better it's implemented all in these ideas in in the turbomol program so i've finished i think just about on time um, I'd like to thank my uh, collaborator, long-term collaborator, Christoph Hettig um, and uh, Gunnar Schmitz, who was a PhD student in his group, worked a lot on these things. Some great conversations with Daniel Katz and my student, Kesha.
So thank you for listening. Thank you very much, David, and you're on time. I appreciate that. Um, now it's time for questions. The first question comes from Philip. If you can unmute your mic and, and ask the question, please. Uh, David, um, what is the stumbling block towards uh, making this parallel? I notice you have several examples which are on numerous cores, but on a single node. So the, um, it's, it's just quite uh, complicated uh, theory. So if you were doing a fragmentation approach, for example, it parallelizes very straightforwardly. You just put different fragments on different nodes. Whereas here you have to go, it's, it, it's not conceptually difficult, it's just technically involved. So you have to really go through every subroutine and work out um, how best to partition the work to distribute it across nodes, which information every node needs and that it's shared among them. So for example, amplitudes are typically shared. Um, which intervals are going to be needed for which it's, it's just involved. It's just harder to do and requires more manpower to do. The good thing is that the um, amplitudes are so compressed that you can keep them in memory typically. So even for these large systems, the, the amplitudes fit in memory. Good. And I was very interested and I wish you good luck uh, with the, uh, the future of this code. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Anybody else has a question? I don't see that. So I uh, kind of ask you, David, to uh, 